Good morning, family and friends. Welcome to First Church of Christ at home. I'm so excited that you're here today and that we have this opportunity to, one, get our eyes on Jesus. Uh, we're going to worship together. We're going to focus on who Jesus is and all that he's done for us and give him thanks. And I'm excited today to be able to share a message with you centered on the love, grace, and mercy of God. My hope, my prayer, is that it encourages you in your walk today. You know, this is an online gathering, and so it's meant to be interactive, and so I hope you'll take a moment and maybe fill out a digital connect card so we have a record of your being with us today. Uh, there's another link where you can share a prayer request. Uh, maybe you have something going on in your life. We, we want the family at First Church to be able to pray for you. And it's also a great way to stay connected to things that are coming up. But you know, more than that, during this online broadcast, there's going to be an opportunity for you to interact with our host online. And so feel free to introduce yourself and say hello in the chat box there uh, if you're watching today through our church online platform. And here's what I hope at the end of our time together, that at the end of this hour or so, that you will walk away more encouraged, connected to Jesus. And that you know Jesus is inviting you to live out his mission this very week. You ready? Enjoy the service.
see the light One, two, three, come on!
God, we love you. We are thankful for this time that we get to worship you. We are thankful that when you draw close, that when we draw close to you, you draw close to us, that it's not one-sided. God, that when we call on you, you show up whenever and wherever that is. God, it's not just in this room, in this church. It's in our own rooms. It's wherever we are. God, where you are is where we want to be. We ask that you come close today in our worship, in this service. Help us to hear what you need us to hear. Help us to see what you need us to see, God. We pray that you accept our worship. God, you are worthy of all praise. This is all for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We can sing this chorus with me one more time. Sing in this room. Let's think about Jesus and the Lord's Supper as seen in the 23rd Psalm. The psalmist writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Who is this shepherd? Well, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He exemplified the good shepherd of the psalm one day when thousands followed him to a lonely place near the Sea of Galilee. Mark says that when Jesus saw them, he was moved with compassion because they were sheep without a shepherd. And like the psalmist shepherd, he had them recline on the green grass and then he fed them. In his description, Mark uses the same four Eucharistic verbs that he used to describe the Last Supper. Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And so they were nourished for their journey. Then the psalm goes on, He leads me in paths of righteousness for His namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Jesus, the good shepherd, often ate in the presence of his enemies. When he dined with Simon the Pharisee, with Zacchaeus the tax collector, and with others, his critics watched. But some were more than critics. Some wanted him dead. The Lord knows full well that today we must make our journey through the dangers of dark valleys and through the wilderness of this world in the presence of many enemies. Paul names them in Ephesians 6. He calls them the spiritual forces of evil. But our shepherd host defies them. He prepares a table before us and he invites us to share in the meal that commemorates him and his victory over those enemies. And so we partake of the broken bread, his body, and the cup, his blood shed for us. And then we leave firm in the assurance of the psalm's closing words, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
This morning, we pick up in our study from the book of Jonah. In just a few moments, we're going to be in chapter 2, so you might want to turn there in your Bible. But first, let's take a moment to review where we've been. In the first verses of Jonah, we read, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. And as I shared a couple of weeks ago, we, we know from history that Jonah or that Nineveh was extremely wicked. And they did horrible things, torturing innocent men, women, children. And God said to his prophet Jonah, you go and preach to those people. God said, go. But as we saw, Jonah said, no. And instead, he got on a boat headed west with a, with a destination about 2,500 2, miles away in Tarshish. But God basically said, this assignment is too important. I'm not going to let you run away from me. And so God hurled this huge storm onto the sea. It was, it was so big, the storm was about to break up the boat. And so the captain of the ship woke up Jonah and he said, Jonah, you're a prophet. Maybe if you pray, if you call on the name of your God, maybe he will save us. And as I pointed out last week, it's kind of curious that this pagan saw more value in prayer than Jonah did. As I said, the world may not want our sermons, but they do want our prayers. And so this captain came to Jonah asking him to pray. And the storm rages on. And eventually Jonah had to admit, it is my fault. I'm running away from God. Throw me into the sea and everything will be fine. And although they didn't want to do it, eventually the sailors realized we have no other choice. And so they threw Jonah overboard. And the very last verse of Jonah chapter 1 says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And that's where we left off last week, with Jonah in the belly of the great fish. Now, can you imagine what it must have been like to be inside that fish? I mean, consider for a moment what a horrible experience that had to have been. Sometimes I think we talk about Jonah being in the belly of the fish three days and three nights as if it were just some normal everyday occurrence. Or we picture Jonah being kind of like Pinocchio and his father setting up a little campfire inside the belly of the well. But I want you to listen to one writer's attempt to picture what it must have been like. Pitch black, sloshing gastric juices washing over you, burning skin and eyes and throat and nostrils. Oxygen is scarce and each frantic gulp of air is saturated with salt water. The rancid smell of digested food causes you to throw up repeatedly until you have only dry heaves left. Everything you touch has the slimy feel of mucous membranes that lines the stomach. You feel claustrophobic. With every turn and dive of the great fish, you slip and slide in the cesspool of digestive fluid. There are no footholds, no blankets to keep you warm from the cold clammy depths of the sea. That's not a very pleasant picture, uh, is it? But God wants us to learn from Jonah that whenever we deliberately choose to disobey him, whenever we choose to deliberately disobey God, we need to be willing to face the consequences of our sin. And Jonah definitely was doing that. And he had some time to think. Uh, Samuel Johnson once said, Nothing focuses the mind like a hanging. And, and what he meant by that is that if a man knows that he's going to die very soon, it has a way of, of clearing his mind of trivial details. For example, if you know you're going to stand in front of a firing squad at sunrise, you don't worry about washing the car. Uh, somebody else can wash the car. You've got bigger things to worry about. 
And that's the way it was for Jonah. I'm pretty sure during the time that he was in the belly of that fish, Jonah wasn't thinking about how he was going to uh, replace his sandals when he got out of this mess. Uh, he wasn't thinking about whether he needed to fix the roof on his house. No, I'm pretty sure his mind was focused on what he had done to get himself into this mess. And that was important because it helped to bring him to his senses. I read something from a man who is involved in ministry to students. And occasionally he's faced with disciplining students whenever they break the rules. And he said, I've dealt with all kinds of students, everything you can imagine, he said. Every sort of sexual sin, cheating, breaking the law, you name it, I've seen it, he said. And then he made two statements that I think are, are, are pretty significant. First of all, he said, almost everyone lies, and they lie all the time. After discussing how people routinely lie to cover up their sins, he offered this conclusion. He said, you can't help a liar. You can help anybody who is struggling with any sort of sin as long as they tell the truth, but you cannot help a liar. And the situation is made worse by the fact that when most of us get caught doing something wrong, we tend to confess as little as possible, which led him to his second point. He said it's always, he said it's always a good sign when they tell you something you didn't already know. Uh, in other words, if you know someone did A, B, and C, uh, but that person uh, tells you, I also did D, E, and F, you can be pretty sure that their repentance is more than, I'm just, a, I'm just sorry uh, that I got caught. Uh, true repentance always involves coming clean. Uh, and, and coming clean means owning up to the whole pattern of wrongdoing, uh, not just the thing you happen to get caught doing. Proverbs 28, 13 says, People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess them and turn from them, they will receive mercy. In 1 John 1, 9, John writes, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins... But it's di very difficult for most of us to, to come to this place of total honesty with God and with others. And it may well be that, that the three hardest words for any of us to say are these, I have sinned. I mean, nobody wants to say that. We would rather do anything, including lying, to keep from having to say those words. Uh, we'll make excuses. We will rationalize, we'll twist the facts, we'll blame others. We'll say, it's not my fault, uh, or, or she told me to do it, or so what? Everybody else is doing it, and the excuses just go on and on and on. And so it's important for you to know this. It's a good sign that you are growing in your maturity as a Christian if it is becoming easier for you to say, I was wrong. That's a good sign because it means that you're taking responsibility for your own actions. It means that you're, you're ready to get your life right with God. It, it means that you're ready to start growing again. Let me suggest something that uh, I think can help you in your Christian walk. Now, what I'm about to say isn't easy to do. And it's certainly uh, not a pleasant thing to do. But if you are serious about wanting to grow in your relationship with God, then I would encourage you to pray this simple prayer. Lord, show me the truth about myself. Just seven words. Lord, show me the truth about myself. And then wait for God to do that. Because when we pray that way, the answer will begin to come to us from God.
I mean, little by little, the Holy Spirit will show us our weaknesses, our faults, our mistakes, our bad attitudes, our foolish words, our pride, our arrogance, our need to be in control, our need to tell others what to do, our desire to have our own way, our anger, our bitterness, our lack of mercy, our lack of love, uh, our lack of compassion. If you will pray that prayer, God will always answer that question for you. But as I said, that's not an easy thing to do. In fact, it's very difficult. And it's understandable if we're hesitant to pray that prayer. I think God knows that. And sometimes God forces the issue. And he answers that question for us without us even asking it. Sometimes God puts us in places where we have to face the consequences of our own stupid choices. Because God cannot ignore our sin. And he loves us far too much to let us go on sinning. And, and so that's why Jonah found himself in the belly of a fish. If God wanted to punish Jonah, he, he could have just killed him, couldn't he? I mean, he could have just killed all of those men on the ship. But because of his grace, God brought Jonah to a place where he could think, where he could reflect on everything that had happened so that he could get himself into a better place. And when he did that, Jonah started praying. Now, we have no record that Jonah prayed while he was back on the ship. But now, Jonah chapter 2, verse 1 says, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. The first thing that Jonah did was to cry out to God for help. In verse 2, he said, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. Jonah said, I cried out in my distress. When things got bad, I called out to the Lord. And what did the Lord do? He answered me. Now, I want you to, to stop and, and think about that for just a moment. I called out to the Lord, and he answered me. Do you really understand what it means that we have the ability to cry out to the God of the universe? the creator and sustainer, the one who hung the stars in the sky, who created the heavens and the earth and, and the vast galaxies that exist, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the supreme judge, the holy one, the one who is all-knowing and ever-present and all-powerful, that God, we can call out to him and he will answer us. Jonah called out to God after he had basically said to God just a few days earlier, forget you, God, forget you. But our God, who is so merciful and so full of grace, was still willing to hear his prayer and to answer him. I want you to think about that. Don't let the power of that pass you by. We can call out to God, and he will answer us. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 that we can draw near to the throne of God or to the throne of grace with confidence. We have the ability to step into the presence of God to receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. We can call out to God and he will answer us. And Jonah says, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Now, Sheol is the word the Jews use to describe where you go when you die. You see, Jonah truly believed that this was the end of the road for him. And so he cried out, I'm so far from God, a place where I am miserable and helpless and desperate and afraid and hurting. And so he, he cried out to God. And I think some of you can probably uh, relate to that. In fact, some of you may be in a similar situation even now. Oh, I know you're not in the belly of a fish, 
But you feel like your life is just spiraling out of control and you're getting further and further and further from God and you're miserable and you're helpless and you're desperate and afraid and hurting. And you haven't done and if you haven't done so already, it's time for you to do what Jonah did and cry out to God. And then second, Jonah acknowledged that God put him where he was. It was God who did it. He says in verse 3, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were, were wrapped around my head. And, and notice that Jonah doesn't blame the sailors for tossing him into the sea nor does he blame the storm or the fish. Jonah sees clearly that behind the ship and the storm and the casting of lots and the raging sea and the great fish, behind all of that stands the great God of the universe. And Jonah humbles himself before God and he says, I'm here because you put me here. And he also knows he, he also knows that there's no way out of this situation unless the Lord rescues him. Without God's help, Jonah is, is Sunday lunch for the big fish, and there's absolutely nothing that he can do about it. And then third, Jonah remembered the Lord. He says, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. After all the running away, after all of the disobedience, after all his self-centered living, God finally has Jonah's undivided attention. And make no mistake about it, God will do whatever it takes to bring us to the place where we remember him. He'll stop at nothing. That includes calamity, sickness, loss, repeated failure, and heartbreak. Whatever it takes to get us on our knees is good for our spiritual growth. And so Jonah says, Lord, I've been running from you for a long time, and now you've got my full attention. And then fourth, Jonah vowed to serve the Lord. Verse 9 says, but I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. And so basically, Jonah is saying, God, if you'll, just, if you'll just get me out of this mess, I will be your prophet. I'll go where you want me to go, and I'll preach what you want me to preach. Just get me out of here. Uh, I find it interesting that Jonah was pleading for one thing that he wasn't willing to extend to the people of Nineveh, the grace of God. The whole reason that he started running in the first place was because he didn't like the fact that God was willing to extend grace to those people over there. Jonah wasn't even sure he wanted to serve a God who showed mercy. And now, here he is begging for God's grace and mercy to be shown toward him. And you know what? That's something I think we all struggle with. It's like the way we feel about police officers. You ever notice that uh, we want to insist that police officers uphold the law as long as it involves someone else? Whenever you see someone turn right on red without stopping or commit some other traffic violation, you think to yourself immediately, I sure wish there was a police officer around here and that he would give them a ticket. But whenever we get pulled over for a traffic violation, what are we thinking as the officer makes his way to our car? Boy, I sure hope he's willing to, to extend a, a little bit of, uh, of mercy. And, and I think that uh, we all do that with God sometimes. Uh, we see people living in sin and we want God to give them what they deserve. But when it comes to our sin, we want God to extend his mercy and his grace, don't we? I mean, I wonder how it would change our view of this world if we were willing to extend the same amount of grace toward others that we want God to show toward us. 
And so Jonah makes this promise. He says, God, if, if you'll save my life, I will do everything within my power to serve you. I'm sorry for the way I acted. I'm, I'm sorry for the way I disobeyed you. If you just save me, I'll spend the rest of my life doing whatever it is you, you want me to do. And you know what? That's the advantage of being in the belly of a big fish. It clears your mind so you can think about what's most important. God had to stop Jonah dead in his tracks in order to get his attention. And I believe that God often needs to do the very same thing uh, with us. I think it would probably do all of us a lot of good if we spent a few days inside the belly of a fish. But since that's not likely to happen, we need to find some other way to get a place where it's just us and God and no distractions. Without TV, without the internet, uh, without our smartphones, just us and God and time to think about what's really important. Because I think often our greatest problem is slowing down enough to hear God's voice. It's amazing and it's frightening to think about how easy it is for, for Christians to go through life without ever talking to God. Why do you think Jonah prayed while he was in the belly of that fish? <laughs> well, for one thing, there wasn't anything else he could do. Without the regular distractions of life, Jonah was able to focus on God. And people will sometimes ask, why doesn't God speak to me? Well, the answer just may be, He speaks to you all the time, but you just won't slow down long enough to listen to Him. All the distractions we have in our lives, the, the, the constant noise, uh, the constant pressure to get things done, uh, to meet our goals, and to cross things off our to-do list, all of it keeps us from talking with God and listening to God. But God knows how to get our attention. And so be careful that you don't make the mistake of saying, there is absolutely no way I could possibly slow down because God has ways of making us slow down. And they're usually not very pleasant, but they accomplish His purpose. And understand this. It's a good thing to be desperate if desperation turns your heart to God. I can't think of a whole lot of things worse than being in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. But I can tell you this, it's better to be in the fish and talking with God than to be out on the dry land and living life totally on your own without even thinking about God. It's a good thing to be desperate if desperation turns your heart to God. And so Jonah, in chapter 1, uh, Jonah tries to run away from God and everything gets all messed up. And then in chapter 2, Jonah prays and things start to get better. At the end of the chapter, we read this, uh, verse 10, And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. The same God who appointed the fish to swallow Jonah now tells the fish to let him go. I mean, one moment Jonah is wedged inside the belly of the fish, and the next minute he's flying through the air and lands on the shore covered with all kinds of gross stuff. The story of Jonah is a lot like the parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 15. You know the story, a young man came to his father and said, Dad, give me my share of the inheritance. And, and so the father did, and the young man took the money, he left his family, and he journeyed to the far country where he spent his money on wild living. And everything was going great until the famine came. And by the way, you can mark this down. The famine will always come sooner or later. You can have your fun and spend your money and live any way you like. You can ignore everything that God says, but eventually the famine will come. And when the money runs out, you will find out that your so-called friends won't return your phone calls 
Oh, they were happy to party with you while you had uh, cash money in your hand, in your pocket, and, and a credit card to cover everything else. But when the money's gone, your party buddies suddenly disappear. And so now the prodigal son is feeding the pigs, hoping to eat some of the leftovers from the slop bucket. And Jesus said when the prodigal son came to his senses, he said to himself, Back home, my father's servants have plenty to eat. I know what I'll do. I'll get up and I'll go to my father and I'll say, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me just like one of your uh, hired hands. And then he began the long, difficult journey back home, ashamed and embarrassed of what he'd done, wondering what his father would do when he got there. But of course, there was no need to worry about that. Jesus said the father saw his son a long way off, which means he had been watching and waiting for his son to come home. Day after day, he waited and he watched until one day he saw his son off in the distance and he ran out to meet him. He couldn't wait to see his son again. After his father had hugged him and kissed him, the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. This was the speech that he had rehearsed. And then he was going to say, make me like one of your hired hands. But he never got to say those words. The father wouldn't let him say it. Instead, his father said, go get some sandals, go find my best robe, get the golden ring, kill the fatted calf. My son who was lost has been found. My son who was far away has come home. Let's get the party started. Remember, I began this lesson talking about how important it is to be honest, to be honest with yourself, to be honest with others, to be honest with God. And some of you this morning, if you are being honest, you know that your life has been looking a lot like Jonah and the prodigal son because you have been running away from God. But I've got some good news for you. Your heavenly Father is waiting for you and the door is always open. The hardest part of coming home is always that first step. Prodigals are scared to take that first step because they're afraid of what's waiting for them at the end of the journey. What if there's no one to meet them? What if no one is glad to see them? What if they're greeted with someone yelling at them? But Jesus paints a picture that assures us that our father stands waiting for his prodigal sons and daughters to come home. And he doesn't say, get yourself cleaned up first. He just says, come home. I cannot wait to see you again. darkness you have filled me with peace giver of mercy you're my help in time me. Lord I can't help but say
You pulled me from the ashes You have broken every curse Blessed Redeemer You have set this captive free Lord, I can't help but see